So when a country is asking for a special features, uh, special feature, what we do is we gather all the other countries and say, okay, so they want this for Italy. What do you think? Uh, should we uh, like because if we switch it on, it will be for everybody. So uh, who uh, wants it? Who doesn't want it? And then the worst case is when people say uh, we don't want it. Uh, uh, at all, I, I don't want to see this feature in my country because then you have a country which is uh, like uh, I want this feature and another country which says I don't want this feature and then mm -hmm. so you have to meet, you but have to you make do. it activable or not. Oh. Uh, this happens sometimes but it's really 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 rare because if people just say I don't mind, I don't mind this feature and one is like I want it, then we make it available for everybody. Um, so we try to, to really grow global and consistent and it's a challenge. So same thing for business model then? Yeah, uh, the business models, we currently uh, have uh, two, well, we have two ways of functioning. At the beginning of the marketplaces, uh, we don't have a booking system in place because there's not enough liquidity in the marketplace, which means that you don't have enough um, supply and demand to be able to apply a booking system. You have to let people call each other, negotiate about the time of departure, the place of departure and everything. So you can't really apply a booking system which is much more demanding in terms of the precision of the information. And uh, like for example, if you have only one or two trips per day to go from here to Munich, uh, then you can't really apply the booking system because you will want to call the driver and say, okay, you said you depart at 4 p.m. but I'd rather go at two. Is that okay with you? So you have to arrange this and this is not compatible with the booking system, but as soon as you get 50 or 100 uh, trips per day, then you can switch to a booking system where uh, the passenger will be booking their, their trips just like they were booking a, a train ticket or a plane ticket. So that's the reason why we have several business models in place. So we have the booking system in some countries and not yet a booking system in other countries. Okay. And I get asked the question also for Germany sometimes because... Um, <laughs> You so know, what's it, the difference with the Germans? No, no, well, the thing is, in, in Germany, we don't charge anything for now. Uh, the, uh, it's, uh, the, there is no booking system. And so uh, I, I had a joke the other day because uh, uh, I was in front of a, a German audience at, uh, at um, uh, WHO, which is a, a, a big university in, uh, in Wallendor, actually. Um, and uh, they asked me when we would charge in Germany and I told them, guys, uh, you know, uh, it, it, there will be at some point a, a business model also applied uh, in, in Germany because uh, otherwise uh, it would mean that uh, it would be the only time that uh, Germans don't pay and all the other countries pay for them. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay, so you know what to expect. <laughs> um, what about the country you said, the first one that you started outside France was Spain? So how was that decision made? What, what are the criteria basically that you're looking at when you want to open a country? Uh, for Spain, it was a bit different uh, than the other countries later on. The first initial move to decide to, to open Spain was actually to make sure that our product was able to handle at least two countries, two languages, which means that you force the entire team into thinking global, at least thinking of a product that can scale in other countries, because if you stay too long with a product in, uh, with only one language, uh, then in the end, after th two, three, four years, uh, you end up with a product which is really hard to move to another language. So I didn't want that to happen. So we made it so that uh, we were able to handle at least two languages at the beginning. And since uh, Spanish and French are very, very close, it was easy for us to test on everything. So it was the easiest language we could go to. And also, it was the country with which we had the more uh, trips already. Because we had a lot of trips from Toulouse to Bilbao, or from uh, Montpellier to uh, Barcelona. So we had a lot of uh, cross-border trips already with Spain. So we said, OK, so we have some liquidity in Spain already, so it would be easier to start there. Um, but then with the other countries, we look much more. It was your beta test country, basically. The what? Sorry? It was the beta test country. Yes. Well, it was, it, it, yeah, it was a, uh, something that would make it so that our product would have the DNA to scale uh, at the very beginning. And then for the other countries, we obviously look at, uh, in more details, uh, we do a market study and we which study parameters like the price of fuel, the price of transportation, the number of people connecting on Facebook, the number of people who have smartphones, um, the alternative for transportation and everything. So we look at the environment and then we decide which country is next uh, and it's uh, the, the best for us to, to go. Uh, and then once we have decided uh, in which country we want to go, we have three ways to expand. 
Uh, the first one uh, is through AquiHire, so we love that. When we find a, a, low, a small company, a uh, small startup who has started the same service as us, like ride sharing, uh, we go to them and we're like, okay, so we, we think there is a potential in, uh, in this country. Uh, do you want to develop that with us? Um, and so when this succeeds, it's the best. Uh, it's the best for everybody, actually, because for the local team, uh, they get funding through us and they get uh, a product which uh, already handles more than 10 million people. Uh, they get uh, customer support, which is already ready, and uh, it's plug and play. And so the local team can focus really on making the service very well known through communications and marketing. And so this is the best. So the first solution is to go through an acquire. hire. The second one is when we have people inside our team who are able to launch the service uh, locally, then we do that. So it's kind of a spin-off. We've done that for Germany, for example. We had five uh, people in our team who were Germans, and so they were able to launch the service in Germany. So uh, they were based in Paris first, and you sent yeah. them to Germany? Yes, they, they, they were based in Paris, and then they went to Hamburg. Um, and so that's the second option. And the third option is obviously to hire a local team. But this is the hardest one, because when you hire a local team, um, you hire someone who doesn't know the space yet. So he has to ramp up on uh, knowing what ride sharing is, uh, what are the incumbents in the country, or who should we talk to. Uh, he has to learn a lot of things. And since in a country, it's really an entrepreneurial role. It's someone who will be alone at the beginning or like building a team, but it's really an entrepreneurial role. Uh, it's, uh, it's hard to identify the, the right person. It's very hard to find the, the very good entrepreneurs. Uh, so we do that uh, when, uh, so we did that for Turkey and India. It works super well, but it's a lot more effort, uh, at least at start. Uh, so the, by far, we prefer the uh, option of quick hiring uh, like uh, new like local players, because at least when we arrive, they know perfectly their uh, domain. They already know uh, everything that you need to know about the country regarding ride sharing. They are motivated, they're entrepreneurs, they want uh, a lot of success, and we bring them all the things that, uh, that help them scale. Okay, you talked about India, which is the latest country that you opened. Um, why did you, it's the furthest away uh, from France that True, you open, yeah. yep. And why did you choose India and not the United States, for example? Uh, as for the United States, it, it will not even be our next country for the United States. So maybe the question is, why not the United States? <laughs> uh, I get that all the time. Um, so... Uh, hey, I didn't ask that. <laughs> oh, you didn't. <laughs> it was the second part of your question. Uh, so for, uh, for the United States, it's... Uh, so some people have tried to do what we do. Mm -hmm. So again, it's long distance ride sharing, so it's nothing to do with short distance on-demand uh, um, on -demand rides like you can find with uh, very good apps, by the way, but which are doing uh, different things than, than what we do. Um, so uh, in the US, some companies had tried to do what we do, long distance ride sharing, and it didn't work, and they invested uh, up to $10 million uh, into uh, trying to make it work, and it didn't. So then we, we tried to see why it did not work, and so uh, in the end, there may be two reasons why it didn't work. The, um, the fuel is cheap in the US, uh, so it's like twice cheaper than in Europe. Um, uh, highways are free, most of them, um, and the GDP per inhabitant is higher. So if you sum, all, sum up all this, the financial incentive for an American driver to share his car is three times lower than the same uh, driver in Europe. So like driving one mile with your car alone in the US is three times less painful in the US than it is in Europe, for example, mm -hmm. which means that an American driver alone in his car is economically equivalent to a European driver already sharing his car with two other people, so like three people in the car. So then if you want to go to share the remaining part, which is one third of the incentive, it's harder. So the first one is economical, we believe. The second reason why in the US it may not have been uh, picking up yet uh, is because the, distance. uh, the distances are longer and the cities are more spread out and the public transit is not as good, well, except for the west, the east coast sometimes, but it's not as uh, developed as in European countries which are much more concentrated with a very good public transit system. Um, so, uh, which makes it so that as a driver, if you want to go from a city to the next uh, and you have passengers, you have to pick them up 
at departure. So go around the city, pick them up, and go around the city, drop them off. So you may lose like half an hour or 45 minutes uh, trying to find your passengers when you depart. And the same when you arrive. You just can't tell them, let's meet at this subway station or what, because sometimes there is no subway. And, uh, and so people, say it's a last mile issue. So we believe that also uh, you, we can't motivate the drivers because financially it's not really uh, interesting. And uh, it's, it's a pain to actually uh, pick There's up no and drop, drop off. There's no drop off and drop, drop. Yeah, it's, it's harder. Mm -hmm. it's yeah. harder. Like, okay. So we believe it's a reason. It's always hard to know or to, to, to guess why it's not working, but we believe that could explain that. And India is a lot better. Uh, in India, it's another issue. They, uh, like All the trains are full. Uh, if you want to travel a few hundred miles in India, you better book your train tickets if not days, weeks in advance, mm -hmm. because sometimes like 10, 10 days in advance, there is no more space at all. Uh, so there is a high demand and uh, an infrastructure able to transport people on a few hundred miles, which is uh, not sufficient. Mm -hmm. So uh, we thought we will use the cars to uh, actually offset some of the demand uh, from the trains, which is unsatisfied, because lots of people want to travel, but they can't, because uh, the trains are full. So that's one of the reasons why we believe India is a, is a very promising market for us. Okay. When you scale like that, there's uh, always issues about, because you do it fast, and then there's a very spread organization, so you need to uh, mostly rethink your organization in terms of being able to manage the whole thing, and that's always a a headache for everybody and trying to find the optimal organization. So what's your answer to that? Um, so the, the first thing is that everybody in the company is aware that the only constant is change. <laughs> so things will change. Like you will not be seated at the same place uh, one month from here. Uh, you will have new colleagues. You may have a new boss. Uh, you will have new people, you will have a new department popping up somewhere doing uh, specificity for the company. So once you get everybody in the mindset that things are going to change, then uh, you've done half of the job because uh, people will uh, think positively about the future and they will not think about uh, static uh, positions and keeping positions because they know that their job will evolve. So it's something we tell everybody in the company. You entered and you had a mission and maybe in three months, six months, maybe even two weeks, your mission will be different and you will be working with different people and it's okay. And that's the only way you can think about adapting your entire structure. And then the second thing we did is also to um, articulate our values. Because when we were 60, uh, so like every year we go to, uh, we go to ski all together in the Alps um, for, for three days. So how many people in the company now? Now we are 220, uh, reaching 250 in, uh, in a month and a half. So a lot but of slopes. Yeah, they, it's, it's actually hard to find a ski resort now that uh, accepts us because we're quite a lot when we arrive. And so, actually, I was discussing yesterday the, the issue that we can't fit in all in the same restaurant anymore. And so we, we may have to split uh, a bit. Uh, I don't know how. But anyway, um, so every year we go to ski like this. And when we were 60, we went to ski. It was about two years ago. And we said, okay, we're growing fast now. Uh, we have a very, very nice ambience. We have strong motivation in the team. We have strong values. Uh, we should articulate them so that the new people who will be joining us know this uh, culture of values and, um, and that they follow it. And so we make sure that uh, we keep this motivation, this seriousness. And so we articulated them. So uh, notions like uh, sharing, innovating, um, uh, came up and then we made some uh, we made some poetry around it. Actually, I always have the, the the values on me, so I can I can read them to you. So one of them says, "The member is the boss." The member is the boss. Yeah, it means we are building a service for our members. So the Who's one says, the boss? The member. The member. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because if the member is not happy, then uh, there is no activity. So we can all go home. Um, so uh, another value is fun and serious. Because we believe in this is the yin and the yang uh, of uh, motivation at work. Uh, we have this one, which says uh, think it, build it, use it. Mm -hmm. uh, which means we are all using our own service. Uh, so like uh, everybody in the company uh, is using it. Share more and more to make sure that we go further. Well, there are 10 of them, but um, yeah, some of them. Which one is interest with trust? I love this one. <laughs> uh, 
so, and then we wrote them, we put them on the wall, uh, we made stickers out of them, so we stick them in, uh, on our computers, and so it, it helps us in our everyday lives to make sure that uh, we keep developing the company in the same spirit as we had at the beginning, because uh, I believe that action-oriented values can replace processes uh, when you grow. And the problem is when you grow fast, you don't always have time to put in place the processes. But uh, values that you are able to express in an action-oriented way can replace processes. Somehow, it's a shortcut to processes because then when people will have to make a decision in their daily professional life, they will think about the value and they will make the decision which fits the value. And so not only they will make the right decision that any that BlaBlaCar would have made if BlaBlaCar is an entity, but also they will own this uh, decision. And so they will feel more responsible and they'll push it forward. So um, yeah, the two things is make sure the team is ready for change and articulate the values, action-oriented values, because we're here to really, uh, to really deliver. It's actually seen from the outside, meaning that you uh, put a lot of work as well on the brand and on the fact that it is consistent around all the different countries, was that also a key of success of expanding the same um, value proposition elsewhere? Yeah, I think so. And also, uh, in France, we changed the brand as well because we were named covaturage.fr. Uh, so, right. And we, we soon remarked that it didn't scale because covaturage <laughs> didn't work. Uh, covaturage in, in Spanish didn't work either. So we, we said, okay, covaturage is not going to scale. So we had to find a brand which scales with sounds that are used in all countries. And, um, and so we came up with this brand. Uh, one day I was quite tired, and then I look at the website. Uh, and uh, actually, when you register on blah blah car, you choose if you are blah 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 or blah 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 to say how much you talk in the car. That's the reason why we are named blah blah car. And uh, so some people don't want to talk, so that's why uh, we, we then you put yourself as blah and you don't talk in the car. But if you talk a lot, you say you're blah blah blah. And so um, and th that was a feature from the start. And uh, so one day I was looking at the website and uh, there was this uh, trip details from uh, a driver and it said he was blah blah and there was his car just next to the, to the blah blah icon. And I just read blah blah car and said, well, that sounds good. Um, and then actually it, on the branding, it took me five years to, to find a brand that would scale and a uh, hundred of uh, sleepless nights. Uh, because I saw it was key in, in the globalization of the concept that we would have one single brand that everybody can pronounce, understand, and if it makes people laugh, it's even better because they remember the brand even better. So in the end, we had 30 brands, uh, 30 names, and uh, I sent them to, uh, to uh, 30 friends uh, in, in uh, inline mail. And uh, a few months after, I was asking them, so which brand do you remember in the list I sent you? And uh, almost all the time, people were saying blah, blah, car. So I was like, OK, this brand is really uh, marking in the head of people. It's crazy. They've read it once in a list of uh, 30 names. And they and remember. Yeah, they remember it. Because sometimes it's, it's a love or hate thing. And then uh, I got a lot of feedbacks from people saying, are you kidding? You would, you're betting the entire future of your company on this uh, silly name. Silly name. <laughs> And so some other times when people understood it was blah, 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 they were saying, oh, it's brilliant. Yeah. And so at least I thought, okay, it's not neutral. <laughs> at least people have a reaction and they remember it. So it will save us millions in marketing because if they remember it just by hearing it once, it means we don't have to pronounce it through the radio, the print, the Facebook, whatever. We don't have to. It's a less, lot, of, uh, lot less effort. One last thing I'd like to have you talk about is there's something that is usually uh, very difficult when you want to scale is to hire at the pace that you want to hire. So how, what is, do you have a secret recipe? Is it a headache like everybody else or? Uh, I think it is a headache. It is still a very high concern for us. So um, we, we thought about, about it uh, two years ago uh, with my co-founders. Um, that we wanted to attract talent, and so in order to do so, we needed to make it so that the company looks uh, really attractive. Because I was tired, actually, to have people in interviews and explaining them, explaining them that we were changing the world and that our company was uh, uh, incredible. And, and so I would spend like 20 or 30 minutes uh, like selling the company again and again and again and again to new people joining. 
And I was like, this is not right. I mean, I can't do that uh, every day, every week, just to explain that we are changing the world. So we will make it so that it is known that we do <laughs> change the world. So now if we change the world, if you want to change the world with us, just come. But then I will not have to sell you the company. And so uh, that's why we also, th those values really helped. And then we made some uh, uh, contests as well to, uh, to get the, the great place to work uh, awards and things like that to show that we have a very, very nice uh, working environment and everybody's super motivated. So we tried to externalize our culture so that it attracts talent back. And so when we get them in interviews, they're already motivated. They already know our culture. They already fit our culture. And it's much easier to recruit talent when they already know that they are joining a company they like than when you have to convince them to join you uh, and explain them why what you are doing is exceptional. And so we've switched. It's taken, it's taken maybe a year or a year and a half until this, uh, this uh, began to happen. And we, we saw people arriving, uh, knowing a lot about the company already and willing to join. And so it drives a lot of motivation. And then you become a magnet for, for talent. So that was our way to go around this uh, very, very tricky problem. Thank you very much. Thank you.